Chapter 8, Patterns of Inheritance. Our modern day understanding of inheritance is thanks to this man and this plant. His name was Johann Gregor Mendel, and he was an Augustinian monk who studied back in the 1800s. He lived in what we now know as the Czech Republic. He taught physics, botany, and the natural sciences. He was particularly interested in plant inheritance. He chose to study that using pea plants as his model system. Thankfully, pea plants show discontinuous variation. That means that when you look at a pea plant and catalog its traits, all of the traits are either this or that. You are purple or yellow, wrinkly or smooth. There is no variation between those two. In other instances when we study traits, some of them have continuous variation. An excellent example of this is the human skin tone. Some of us are very, very pale, some of us are very, very dark, and there's someone who exists at almost every level in between. Had Mendel not chosen a discontinuous variation plant, he may have never reached the conclusions that he did. He was also lucky in choosing true breeding plants. He knew exactly what all of the offspring of his chosen plants were going to look like, and that allowed him to make hybridizations, or mixes of two different types of true breeding plants. As he bred plants for years and years in his back abbey garden, he traced both the parents and all of their offspring for numerous generations, and he kept copious notes. The first generation of each of his study was labeled as the P generation. Every generation thereafter was labeled F1, F2, F3, so on and so forth. F simply means filial, which is a word that relates to offspring or children. Gregor also kept copious notes on all of the traits and decided to label some as dominant and others as recessive. We'll see what that means in just a minute. Here's what one of his experiments looked like. He chose to cross two different true breeding plants. They were the same in all aspects except one. In this case, their flower color. He mixed a violet adult with a white adult, and he found that all the offspring in the F1 generation in the F1 generation had purple flowers. When he allowed them to self-fertilize, they created the F2 generation, and he found about a three to one ratio of violet flowers to white flowers. This ratio tended to repeat itself with multiple other traits that he chose to study. He looked at seed shape and color, flower color and position, pod shape and color, and finally stem height. There was a lot of information that Mendel simply couldn't have known, but that we have gathered from knowledge gained after his studies were published. Let's put some terms to that information so it's a little bit easier to talk about. We can discuss items phenotype, and that's the way that they look. Something can be blonde hair and green eye, or maybe yellow and smooth. We can discuss an organism's genotype, and that's a reference to what the genes actually say that control that particular phenotype. We can look at dominant genes, which when written out tend to be written with capital letters. And when you have a dominant gene, we now know that you always see it. If you carry one dominant gene, even though you have two copies of every gene, you're definitely going to see that dominant trait. Recessive genes are the opposite. Recessive genes are written as lowercase letters, and you can only see recessive genes if that's the only gene that you carry. We find that all organisms fall under the categories of being homozygous or heterozygous. Now you can be homozygous dominant, Homo means same, and that means that both of your alleles are the same. They're both dominant. Or you can be homozygous recessive. That means both of your alleles are the same, but they're both recessive. The other option is that you are heterozygous. You carry one dominant and one recessive allele. Remember though, you have to have two recessives in order to see it. So that means you're showing the dominant trait. We're gonna look at quite a few of these examples if that sounds a little odd. Just remember that phenotypes are the physical expressions of traits as transmitted by alleles. 
and alleles are just different types of the same gene. Capital letters represent dominant alleles, and lowercase letters represent the recessive ones. Phenotypic ratios are the ratios of characteristics that you can see. The genotypic ratios are the ratios of the different gene combinations, and you can't always tell those apart. An example that you might have heard of previously of recessive alleles popping up are those that are tied to individuals who show albinoism. Albino individuals have received two recessive alleles from both of their parents. Because their parents didn't have two themselves, they didn't show the trait. However, this little one received two recessive alleles. That's all they had, and therefore, they have the albino phenotype. We now have a more modern understanding of inheritance. We know how gametes are made through meiosis. There is a natural law called the law of segregation, and it says that during gamete formation, the alleles for each gene segregate from one another so that each gamete only has one allele for each gene. That means that those individual gametes have the exact same odds of getting every gene, and therefore every offspring has the exact same odds as getting every gene as every other offspring that exists in their generation. Sometimes you hear people say, well, she has four boys, odds are she has to have a girl next time. That's not true. In every single instance, there's a 50-50 chance of one particular outcome. That's what we can now study in genotypes. We found it gets far more confusing in humans, especially because we usually have multiple genes for every trait, but you get the idea. With our understanding of genetics currently, we can even work backwards to determine the genotypes of parents after examining their offspring. This process is called creating a test cross. A test cross can be performed to determine whether an offspring ex expressing a dominant trait is a homozygote or a heterozygote. By testing an unknown individual with a known individual and examining the offspring, you can figure out the unknown genotype. That's because when you mix an unknown individual with someone who is homozygous recessive, you know exactly what you're looking at when you examine their children. If you mix a homozygous dominant individual with a homozygous recessive individual, all of their kids are heterozygous, so they'll only appear as dominant. However, if you mix an unknown individual with a homozygous recessive individual and some of their kids are also recessive, you know that that unknown parent must have given a little allele or a recessive allele in order for their children to show it. We can study allele frequencies using a Punnett square. Here you see a Punnett square in a monohybrid cross or a cross where there's only one trait that's different. This Punnett square shows a cross between plants that are yellow and plants that have green seeds. The cross between the true breeding P plants produces an F1 generation that's all yellow. They're allowed to self-fertilize, so that plant shares its genes essentially with itself. The self-cross of the F1 generation can be analyzed in another Punnett square to predict the genotypes of the F2 generation. Given an inheritance pattern of a dominant recessive, the genotypic and phenotypic ratios can be determined. If you're unfamiliar with Punnett squares, it's simply a way to draw the relationship between the different genotypes and trace where they're capable of going. In this very first example of the P generation, you see a yellow plant that has two big Y alleles and a green plant that has two small y alleles. We can place them into a Punnett square. We draw Punnett squares by creating a square and then add a plus sign in the middle. You put one parent's alleles on the top 
and the other parent's alleles on the bottom. You fill them in by bringing down all of the column headings and pulling across all of the row headings. What you end up with in the boxes are all of the potential gene pairings of every offspring. You can see yet another Punnett square drawn for the F2 generations. Parent A is on top with their big Y and their little Y, and parent B is on the side with their big Y and little Y. What you see in the middle after you bring your rows across and your columns down is all of the potential pairings of what their kids might look like. Crosses can get way more confusing and you can actually consider a dye hybrid cross. And that's when you mix plants that vary in two traits. A dye hybrid cross in these pea plants involves genes for both seed color and texture. The pea cross of F1 offspring produces individuals that are heterozygous for both of the characteristics. When you count up all of the different ways that these individuals look, you end up with some pretty interesting phenotypic results. I'll create a second video for you that looks just at dihybrid crosses. These pink flowers are an example of a different dominant types. Heterozygous snapdragons end up as pink because they carry one red and one white allele. In instances of dominance such as this one, we say that the dominance pattern is incomplete. Another example is codominance. In this Punnett square, you can see A, B blood types. It's yet another cross, so let's look. One parent had both the A and B allele, and the other parent happened to have the A and B allele as well. However, that means that some kids are going to get two A's, some kids are going to get an A and a B, and some kids could just get B's. It turns out in the human blood type, if you get both an A and a B, neither is dominant over the other. You end up simply showing both traits. And that's how you end up with the AB blood type. Here's a chart that shows you the inheritance of the AB and O blood types. In this instance, you do see a little bit of dominance and recessive. You'll notice there are capital I's and lowercase i's. In the case of the human blood type, if you have a capital I, that means that you have a carbohydrate that sticks from the outside of your red cells. You might have the A type of carb, or you might have the B type of carb, and that's where that AB designation comes from on your blood type. If you don't have a carb though, that means that you have a little i, or a recessive trait. So when you meet an individual who has A blood, they might be big IA, big IA, meaning they have two traits for A blood, or they might be big IA, little i, because the little guy's recessive, he doesn't affect anything. If you end up with two recessive traits, that's when we say that you have type O blood. Individuals with type O blood have absolutely no carbs jutting from the outside of their red cells. The next type of dominance is something called sex-linked dominance. In Drosophila melanogaster, these little flies, the gene for eye color is located on the X chromosome. Red eye color is wild type, and it's dominant to white eye color. Crosses involving sex-linked traits often give rise to different phenotypes for different sexes of offspring, as is the case for crossing red eye and white eye colored Drosophila. And this diagram, a little w is a white eye mutant allele, or the recessive allele. And the big w is the wild type red eye allele. You see that the big w travels along with the X chromosome. So that unless you get an infected X and two of them, you're not going to see that odd allele. Genes that are linked, those that are loaded, located very close together on chromosomes, don't always follow all these interesting laws and dominance patterns. They definitely don't follow the law of independent assortment. Linked genes travel together more often than not, simply because they're rarely split in the meiotic processes. You always see capital A next to capital B just because they're hard to split. To throw one final wrench in the beautifully simplistic ratios originally presented by Mendel, we must discuss epistasis. Genes make proteins. Proteins affect our phenotypes. 
Sometimes proteins can affect each other and change their intended outcomes. Other times, genes can actually directly affect one another, and that's what we call epistasis. Here's an example as seen in mice. One gene, let's call it gene C, it masks the expression of gene A for coat color. When allele C or gene C is present, coat color is expressed. You can have a color on your coat. When gene C or allele C is absent, you can't have a color on your coat and you end up as an albino white mouse. Coat color depends on the gene A, which shows dominance, with the recessive homozygote showing a different phenotype. It's a pretty interesting little caveat when it comes to our study of genetics. That ends our introduction to inheritance. Next, you should read your book, take your own notes, consider other resources, and finally, do your homework.